Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of 2017's Logan, the third Wolverine solo film and perhaps the peak artistic achievement to come out of the Fox X-Men franchise. This is the 10th installment of our X-Men Snick Snick rewatch as we go back through all 13 of the Fox X-Men and Deadpool films ahead of Wolverine's Mutant Homecoming and Deadpool and Wolverine in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In this video, we are gonna talk about why Logan is so praised and how despite the film ending on sacred holy ground that Ryan Reynolds vowed not to touch in Deadpool and Wolverine, elements of this movie may come back in the MCU. But don't worry, I will be saving all of those theories and speculation for the danger room section at the end of the video. Let's go through Logan scene by scene to discuss why it is so great and to point out details you might have missed. And the best way to support new rock stars is to grab one of these Xavier Institute shirts by clicking the link in the description or going to nerdriot.shop. Okay, the film opens with nothing special in the studio fanfare, no prologue, just a simple close-up of Logan passed out in the back of his limo as he rises, jacked up into frame by a group of thugs trying to boost the hubcaps. It's like Logan is trying to die, but he is being jerked back out of the grave for one last fight. There is just so much great visual exposition in these opening seconds, like that bottle of booze on the car seat beside Logan's head, the dusty worn shoes, to let us know that this suit he is wearing just for work, and him grunting that this limo is just a lease, and then blam, shotgun blast to the chest. While we saw Logan take shots like this in 2013's The Wolverine, and even shots to the head in X2 and X-Men Origins, and now takes him forever to get back up. Even the title of the movie, Logan, appears with him on the ground as if it is struggling to get up with him or maybe even weighing him down. As we will see in this movie, a single adamantium bullet won't even have the same effect on Wolverine physiology as it did before. And I have to talk about how on page two of the screenplay that was written by Scott Frank, James Mangold, and Michael Green, there is a screenwriter's note that I absolutely love and I cite every time self-claimed screenwriting gurus say you should never direct from the page. Here's what it says. If you're on the make for a hyper choreographed, gravity defined city block destroying CG thon this ain't your movie. In this flick, people will get hurt or killed when shit falls on them. And then goes on to say, as for our hero with his so-called eternal life and healing, well, he's older now. If you keep reading, you'll discover Logan's about to get his ass kicked. But before we get to that, we should make it clear his abilities ain't what they were. Yes, he's a drunk, but he's also fading on the inside. Adamantium implants leeching into his system, causing chronic pain and diminished healing, hence booze as a painkiller. Now, James Mangold himself would direct this script, so really this was written as a note to the rest of the crew to the actors and to the studio as a full declaration of how this movie would be different from the MCU and other X-Men films that we were used to. Behind them on this roadside are ads for Hypno and Mag, fuel your fire. Hypno is the energy drink with the corn syrup that contains the anti-mutant poison that comes back throughout the film. Mag is the shipping company that operates the driverless semis that distribute the corn syrup. And we see in a wider shot a little bit after this that all of these are on billboards that are LED displays, which is just a little sign showing that this is a near future setting and all of these screens are advertised the conspiracy that is killing all the mutants. Logan draws his claws, but they don't extend all the way out, and one of them hardly at all. From the Deadpool and Wolverine trailer, we know how important a full mast snicked is to the character's virility. In the fight, the thug's lug wrench hits Logan in the back. <laughs> Yeah, that is the chrome dust from where Logan warned them that they would strip the chrome plated lugs. But in effect, it kind of makes it feel like Logan is shattering, like he's super brittle. So when the bullets start flying, he uses his body to stop bullet holes from going into the limo. That is his priority. Once he's pinned to the ground, Logan just goes berserk and he slices the guy with the shotgun, recalling that smooth severing of the shotgun and spilling the buckshot in the first X-Men film. But now he just wildly misses and cuts the gunman's arm off and the severed hand at the end of that arm squeezes the trigger when it hits the ground and sprays the limo with buckshot, exactly what Logan did not want. So now he just loses it. And then he snicks up their guy's chin and then he rapid stabs another guy. And behind him in this shot, you can see the one with the now severed arm being helped up. That guy escapes and runs off into the van and Logan hurls the crowbar at his side of the windshield. And I break all this down because despite Logan proclaiming to be the least superhero-y, it actually has the smartest fight choreography I think of any Marvel movie I've seen. Like everything has weight and consequences. It's all really well thought out. So Logan changes in this gas station bathroom and he squeezes squeezes the bullets out one by one of his wounds. And again, compared to the bullet that just popped out of his own forehead in X2, it just feels like he really has to focus now. And not every bullet is gonna make its way out of its body. His Chrysler limo has a futuristic digital display listing his chauffeur permit under the name James Howlett, showing that he has reverted to using his birth name now that he's living off the grid. And it sets this movie's date as December 8th, 2029, which gets confirmed on this radio show. Poison water, mutants, it's all connected. It's 2029. 
Why are we still talking about mutants? So James Mangold set this film in 2029, which would be about five or six years after the restored timeline ending of Days of Future Past. This movie contains nods to the past X-Men films, but this is a future in which most of the X-Men were killed off by one of Charles Xavier's psychic seizures, and several other mutants have been gradually eradicated through chemicals in the food and water supply. Now, I think we all like to think of Logan as a story that's just not bound directly by the continuities of the previous films, but we should remember that James Mangold pitched this movie to be a sequel to Days of Future Past and to The Wolverine, and it is informed by all X-Men movies, but all those X-Men movies kind of have a disconnected continuity and timeline logic. So really, I think the best way to look at Logan is just this is one timeline where Logan finally finds peace in death. Like there may be other X-Men timelines out there where the X-Men and Wolverine live on or maybe die out in some other battle. But in this timeline, for Logan to peacefully let go, he needs to be in a world so bleak that he's alone once more until he meets someone who reminds him of Rogue and he dies knowing that there is hope for this young woman and there's hope for mutant kind. So I think of Logan as Logan's sacred timeline. When this film was announced, many believed it would be an adaptation of the Old Man Logan comic storyline by Mark Millar and Steve McNiven, art by Mike Diodato Jr., which is set in an alternate universe, post-apocalyptic America, where an aged Wolverine and a blind Hawkeye go on a road trip. This film isn't set in as extreme of a post-apocalypse, like there's no incestuous trailer park warlord Hulk or a giant rotting corpse of Hank Pym, but James Mangle paints a post-apocalypse landscape that is frighteningly reflective of our present day. Like, I'm more afraid of the post-apocalypse in Logan with its self-driving cars and tainted food supplies than I am of like the camps in Central Park in Days of Future Past, because this is a post-apocalypse that looks like what we're currently living in. Like, it's true sci-fi. It's plausible and terrifying. These prom night bros that Logan chauffeurs are all drinking that hypno energy drink from the ad before. While it would make more sense for them to be drinking beer, they're all drinking hypno, which is even worse because they're like energetic. These guys all chant USA past a line at the Mexican border. With this movie coming out in 2017, Mangold wasn't being subtle at all about what types of social values would continue to fester in America in this timeline. Clipped into his fold down mirror is the ad for the Sunseeker boat that he's saving up to buy for him and Charles. And Logan chauffeurs people at a funeral at Greenwood Cemetery. Cemetery. Greenwood Cemetery is a cemetery in Brooklyn in Marvel Comics. And yes, there are headstones for Rogers and Peters, but those are just generic names, people. Like, Cap isn't dead here. And that's not like Evan Peters. Logan reaches into his trunk, and Gabriella turns and runs. She thinks he's going for a gun, but he's just getting the umbrella. And considering the thugs shot Logan within seconds of meeting him, it just tells you what 2029 America feels like here. Her car with X-23, Laura, in the backseat, has plates from Chihuahua, Mexico. Boyd Holbrook plays Donald Pierce. In the comics, Donald Pierce is a wealthy industrialist and cyborg and anti mutant bigot whose name came from Hawkeye Pierce and MASH. He first appeared in X-Men 132 in 1980 and was the founder of the Hellfire Club, but was best known as a member of the Reavers, which is the name given to the militant group in this film. Now, in the broader world of X-Men, Holbrook actually dated and was briefly engaged to Elizabeth Olsen in 2014, but he's not good enough for our queen. No one is. Pierce says that the roadstop crime scene looked like it was done by Freddy Krueger or an escaped tiger and says that one is fictional and the other is extinct, implying that in this future, tigers are extinct. Yikes. Pierce says, I heard you was in Phoenix. <laughs> Even if the line wasn't meant this way, Mangle did make the 2013 Wolverine movie where Logan is haunted by sexy dreams of Jean Grey, aka Phoenix. So you know Logan hears this line differently. The business card that Pierce hands him is for Alkali Transigen, where he works security. Transigen is the company of Dr. Xander Rice, and it just proves that they merged with whatever was happening at Alkali Lake at this point in the future. And Logan remembers that location fondly. South of the border, Logan now lives in an old smelting plant. The original idea was for Logan and Charles to live in an abandoned bourbon distillery in Kentucky, and for Charles' room to be a bourbon tank. But while location scouting, they found this overturned water tank, and they're like, that looks sick. Greeting Logan is Stephen Merchant as Caliban, an albino mutant who can sense and track other mutants. A younger version of Caliban appeared in 2016's X-Men Apocalypse. Mangled cast Stephen Merchant largely for his immense height. He's 6'7", which is like half a foot taller than an already tall Hugh Jackman, which just gives the effect of making Logan look like he's shrinking in stature. He just doesn't tower as tall in this movie as he does in other X-Men movies. In the adjacent tank, you can hear Charles shouting, I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. Well, honor is the subject of my story. This comes from William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar Act one scene two, and we just know that Patrick Stewart is a Shakespeare scholar. Be or not a bee. As Logan enters the tank, Charles goes to reciting the Little Miss Muffet nursery rhyme, and then when he sees Logan, he says this. 
Friends, I have good news for you today. It's not about what you do. It's not about your deeds. This incoherent rant seems like the kind of sermon characters like Reverend Stryker would give in the comics, but it's also a declaration for these two imperfect versions of these heroes who still are part of God's plan. Charles's toppled water tower has holes worn into the metal, letting sunlight shine through, which creates a visual effect similar to Cerebro, which was by design by the art director. Instead of a Cerebro that connects Charles to all mutants, this dome shields them from him. Charles slips into a psychic seizure, which hits right as Caliban has a sharp knife in his hands preparing dinner, which is just a little way of showing how scary it would be to be anywhere near Charles Xavier. Logan has to fight through this seizure using his healing abilities, which would mean he's like suffocating himself, but then like recovering from it to go right back into suffocation. His nerve cells would be dying, but then slowly trying to repair themselves. And finally, he's able to end it with the syringe. He gives Charles these two pills. How about you blowing him to make him safe? F off, Logan. This reminds us of their past exchanges in First Class and in Days of Future Past. Excuse me, I'm Eric Lynch. Charles Xavier. Go f yourself. And I'm going to say to you what you said to us then. F off. On Charles's nightstand includes the book Ulysses, the 1922 James Joyce novel that transposes the story of Odysseus into modernist prose, the kind of stream of consciousness language, which you might see as similar to Charles's ramblings. Charles references the X-Men film from 2000. I'm waiting for you at the Statue of Liberty. He also links Logan's origin in the 2000 film to his past in X-Men Origins, the 2009 film. You were a warm capper to a life of an assassin. You were a... Uh... Animal. So, assassin and animal, he's totally referencing a part of Logan's timeline with Stryker and Team X that technically was erased in Days of Future Past, but Logan still remembers it. Ever since that ending of Days of Future Past, only Logan would know and Charles would know about it by like reading Logan's mind or by talking to him. So, through his dementia, Charles is remembering histories that were erased from the timeline of the world he's now living in. In fact, having all that knowledge might have been something that expedited both his and Logan's aging. Like, who could live with all of that? So, in Logan's room, he has Yashi does Katana from 2013's The Wolverine, and we see the dog tag that he received in 2009's X-Men Origins. So really, as a thematic epilogue to all of his past exploits, the movie Logan is a story that puts him up against incarnations of himself, his past as X-24, and his future as X-23. His ultimate goal is to just rid the world of the entire Wolverine curse while trying to preserve the one good thing about that legacy in Laura. So that claw that jammed earlier, Logan now grabs with his hand and pulls it all the way out to be as long as the other two, cutting his hand in the process. Process. He has to do this to loosen it because if you were to try to retract them when it's jammed like this, it would just stay stuck. So he has to pull it all the way out before it can go all the way back in. Kind of like a jammed car window. It's implied he has to do this every freaking night. Director of photography John Matheson lights the scene with a single key light outside the dirty curtains to cast harder shadows on every single one of Logan's scars. Because having Wolverine have scars at all is such a huge deal for this film. And there's a really cool effect here where in shot they shift the exterior light from yellow to blue to signal a passage of time, but that blue light matches exactly the blue light in Charles's Cerebro tank, so it kind of feels like Logan's pain is something Charles is trying to sense. Like, Charles's entire arc in this movie is to gradually understand why Logan feels guilty, and that's something really hard for someone with dementia to do. Caliban confronts Logan on his unhealing wounds, noticing fresh pus from his knuckles, calling out Logan for all of his drinking, and the fact that his vision is so bad he could not read the label on the pill bottle he just handed him. Caliban reveals it is just ibuprofen, which is so embarrassing for Logan. But most embarrassing, Caliban found in Logan's laundry this adamantium bullet. This would be Stryker's adamantium bullet from X-Men Origins, meaning that Logan still carries it from that moment on Three Mile Island. Now before, remember, that bullet is supposed to just wipe Logan's memories. But now, with this slower healing, Logan carries it with him as an opportunity to possibly end things. Caliban smells this bullet and he says, Something's happening to you, Logan. On the inside, you're sick. I can smell it. I love this. Rather than just having Caliban sense mutant powers in kind of a mental abstract sense, he uses the physical gesture of smelling it. It's just a really cool way to show how his powers work. Logan chauffeurs some party girls, and I love how when he opens the limo door, one of their dresses was already stuck outside the car door, getting dirty, and she was just too drunk to notice, and Logan was definitely too drunk to care about when he helped them in. It might also be just because of his bad eyesight, because notice he's now wearing these glasses with the tags still on. So he meets Gabriella and Laura, played by Daphne Keene. 
Wolverine. Laura, aka X-23, the 23rd X-23, is a female Wolverine clone who actually originated in season three of X-Men Evolution, the animated series that aired on Kids WB in 2003. Keen won this part after Millie Bobby Brown also auditioned for it. Inside Gabriella's motel room, Logan sees a newspaper clip, lack of mutant births, stump researchers, is there something in the water? Now the text of the article is a bunch of filler nonsense, but a mutant fertility crisis kind of reminds us of the not so distant future post-apocalyptic film Children of Men, but this is just targeted at mutants specifically. X2 suggested that the X gene was passed down through men, so we are looking at a generation where mutant males have really been sterilized through a toxin in the food supply that was slipped through the corn syrup from Canewood. Now you could say it's only been about five years since Days of Future Past, but that changed timeline may have changed things to a secretly sinister timeline where for years history had been unfolding this way as a result of what Nathaniel Essex had been doing since 1983. Or if it wasn't Mr. Sinister in particular, maybe just in the society, pharmaceutical companies and agricultural companies just started to do this decades prior and they didn't even notice it until now. Beneath this newspaper article is one of Laura's X-Men comics. James Mangold included these comics as a metafictional reference to the fact that in 2029, X-Men had been mythologized in the comic book medium and he wanted those comics to have the same exact look and design of real uncanny X-Men comics. They even commissioned Marvel writer Joe Quesada and artist Dan Panosian to create 10 fake comics in the style of the Bronze Age era. On this cover, Wolverine is being thrown by Colossus in the iconic fastball special move that we talked about in X-Men The Last Stand. And there might be a specific reason why this image is on this cover, I'll get to it later. But with this Logan film, James Mangold deconstructs the comic book superhero film genre the same way that Clint Eastwood did to the Western film genre in the film Unforgiven, which is an amazing film. In that movie, Eastwood plays a washed up gunslinger who gets dragged back onto a mission based on his cowboy reputation and proceeds to scare the living shit out of everyone in the movie. Like even Morgan Freeman is like, I don't think I could be in this movie anymore. And really that was the movie's deeper agenda, that the whole white hat, black hat tropes just are not true. And real stories about killing are not for the faint of heart. Mangold explained, quote, the reality was that like in Unforgiven, when Eastwood runs into Richard Harris, who's writing these fictional accounts of the great Western heroes, or Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, who kind of are twilight versions of their own legends. I think the idea of being a kind of celebrity or like a sports star long past your heyday was really interesting for me to investigate with this kind of world. Gabriella, along with Pierce and others seeking Logan, all call him Wolverine a lot in this movie. I think the moniker is spoken more in this film than most other X-Men films. They say it a lot in X2. And I just think it's surprising for this grounded story, but it is an interesting reflection of the way society has turned Logan into like a legendary folk figure. When Logan comes back to the motel later, he finds Gabriella dead and her side of a text conversation with him where she wrote but never sent, they hear, please, kind of like the Book of Monster Bull and Fellowship of the Ring where Ori had scrawled, they are coming in Dorvish before the ink dragged off off the page. Pierce catches up with Logan back in Mexico and he talks about Charles. Damn shame what happened back east. It's been dead for a year. Yes, a hint at the Westchester incident where one of Charles's seizures killed the X-Men and we learned that it happened just a year prior. And that as far as the public is concerned, Charles Xavier himself was one of the mutants who died in that. When Pierce grabs Logan's arm, we see that his cybernetic arm has leather fingerprints with ridges on the tips, which is just such great attention to detail because this is how he would actually be able to grip things and use things like touch screens. Now you'll notice all of the Reavers have cybernetic limbs and I wonder if the idea was for them to be former military who had lost limbs in war, like the extremist subplot of Iron Man 3. Or maybe with all the corn syrup in the food, it was all done. Diabetes. But the rest of the Reavers arrive with Mexican police and Laura does not get up from finishing her cereal and just patiently waits for the bulkiest Reaver to come to her. And then we don't see what happens, but she shows up outside to bowl his severed head at Pierce. Yes, this movie was very R-rated and it's awesome. They chase her inside and we go back to Charles and notice how he lets off the faintest smile. Like he's so excited that the X-Men now might be back. Inside, we stay on the point of view of one of these Reavers and the police until the camera suddenly cranes up and Laura pounces on one of them and goes to town on the rest. She leaves from man to man. What Daphne Keene and her 11-year-old stunt double Naya Murphy do so well is convey the rage and the pain with screams and growls on every swipe, mirroring Hugh Jackman's animalistic intensity. Just a reminder that for heroes like this, every snit hurts every time. We see Laura, a little girl, getting harpooned. And then she pulls it out of her chest and chops off the cable. She sneaks her additional foot-mounted blade to drag herself in the dirt and then uses that extra blade to kick her captor's leg and neck. 
Later, Charles explains that the two sets of claws mirror the lioness, which uses its front claws for hunting and its back claws defensively. And that, you'll notice, is what Laura does here. She uses her hand claws to attack and her foot claws only to break free. I also appreciate how in this opening fight, notice how Logan tries to leave Laura behind multiple times. Like he's not at all interested in saving the cat. Laura has to fight to get into Logan's limo. And when she does, she's shot in the arm and then she sucks out the bullet. And notice how James Mangold has smartly punctuated the first act of this film with several shots of the passing train by the smelting plant. So now when Logan tries to break free of the compound, he spots the train on the other side of the fence, and then, seeing an opportunity, he charges toward it. Two Reavers try to slow them down, but Laura fends them off, and I love how when she stabs the one in the back, two holes are left in the glass from her claws. Logan veers into the SUV and uses it to absorb the impact of the train engine as he swerves in front of it, creating one border that Pierce cannot pierce. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Mental health can be a hard thing to wrap your mind around. Everybody has off days, but when those days start becoming more frequent or taking more of a toll, it's time to find a therapist which is exactly what BetterHelp can help you do. BetterHelp makes starting therapy easier and less intimidating for a lot of people. First, you just go to their website. You can use our link, betterhelp.com slash newrockstars. You answer a few questions and BetterHelp will match you to a professional who has years of experience helping people with struggles just like yours. You can do it all from your phone or computer, via phone call, video chat, or messaging, however you feel the most comfortable. It's the easiest possible way to start talking to a therapist. You'll be matched with therapists usually within 48 hours, so you can get started fast. Let BetterHelp connect you to a therapist who can support you all from the comfort of your own home. Visit betterhelp.com slash new rock stars or choose new rock stars during sign up and enjoy a special discount on your first month. Charles and Logan watch the video on Gabriella's phone where we learn Transigen was experimenting on children that they bred from test tubes saying that their fathers were semillas geneticas, special seeds in bottles. We see shots of the serum and presumably one of these includes the DNA that was taken from the Alkali Lake facility by Mr. Sinister's Essex Corporation in the post credit scene of X-Men Apocalypse. It would have been set in 1983, and it explains why the company is called Transigen Alkali. Xander Rice's father worked at Alkali, and now the two companies have just merged. Now you'll notice during this footage, we see the young mutant Richter playing with a rubber ball. This is the same ball that Laura had been playing with in the parking lot of the motel, and the one that Logan and Caliban found in the trunk. Also in this footage, we meet Dr. Xander Rice. In X-23's comic origin in 2005, after she was first introduced in X-Men Evolution, Xander Rice was the son of the scientist who worked on the original Weapon X program, but that scientist was killed when Wolverine escaped, which Rice says in this movie later, I believe you knew my father on the Weapon X program. I think I might have killed him. I th I think you're right. But in the comics, Xander Rice went on to become the surgical head of the Facility Project to recreate Weapon X and worked with Dr. Sarah Kinney, who's trying to clone Wolverine and produced a female clone, but Xander forced Sarah to be the surrogate mother, delivering the girl who became X-23, and he carried out the Weapon X surgical process to put adamantium on her bones. Here he is played by Richard E. Grant, who would go on to play classic Loki in season one of Loki in the MCU. They stop by a gas station where there are signs outside and stickers in the bathroom for Hypno Energy Drink, and Laura cracks one of these open to take a sip. Now you may wonder why doesn't the corn syrup in this energy drink or in the cereal she was eating earlier hurt Laura? Well, Xander actually explains this later in a line to Caliban. Unlike you, she isn't pure. She wasn't made by nature. So I guess this movie's explanation is that Laura and the others were not naturally born mutants. They were really just genetic experiments using mutant DNA. Also, I think the toxin just shortens mutant lifespans and affects their fertility. Because, you know, if every mutant were to drop dead the moment they took a sip of Hypno, people would notice. Outside Oklahoma City, Logan recharges Gabriella's phone to watch the rest of the video where some mutant kids become suicidal and the nurses learned of a project with the ID of X-24 with Hugh Jackman's limbs shown in a water tank similar to the tank that Logan was in during his procedure. Gabriella refers to to a mutant refuge in Canada called Eden, obviously reference to the garden, the book of Genesis, where life began. Gabriella recorded this in her motel room with Laura sleeping in the background the night they were waiting for Logan, I guess. So did she also edit all this footage into this one watchable video project file all on her phone? I don't know, maybe 2029 had some great video editing apps. So they drive through Oklahoma City and they stay at a Harrah's casino. They actually shot this at the New Orleans Harrah's and Daphne Keene as a minor was not allowed to set foot inside a casino unless escorted by Louisiana's governor. So all the shots of her in this casino floor had actually been shot on a soundstage with green screens. Laura sees a little girl mannequin holding hands with a papa mannequin. Considering Rice had told the nurses not to humanize these kids, this might be the first time she has seen this gesture and recognizes it as a form of love. And we will see her do this during Charles's funeral and as Logan dies later. But the next morning, Laura and Charles watch on the TV George Stevens' 1954 Western film Shane, which Charles says that he watched at the Isoldo Cinema in his hometown. He's presumably referring to the Longford Isoldo in Stratford, Manchester, which was open from 1936 to 1997. Patrick Stewart apparently improvised this line 
so this probably was a real memory the actor had as a boy. Shane was one of many films that influenced James Mangold, along with Unforgiven, The Cowboys, Paper Moon, and The Gauntlet. And Shane, a gunslinger with a mysterious past, helps Wyoming homesteaders against a ruthless gang and ends up in a brutal fight that leaves him bleeding out and telling young Joey, Joey, there's no living with a killing. There's no going back from one. Right or wrong, it's a brand, a brand that sticks. And then after clearing all the guns from the valley, Shane trots off on his horse, slowly dying, as Joey calls out to him, Shane, come back! These words will come back in the final scene of this film, and it's telling that Laura has to learn humanity from a Western film, like how she learns about heroism from X-Men comics. It's all part of how this film elevates the power of legend. Like at some point, we stop being people as much as we're just living on as narratives to teach the next generation how to live. And I love how when we see this final scene with Joey and Shane, you can see Charles <laughs> reflected in the TV screen. Because Charles Xavier is now like part of the legend legend that we are learning from. Logan flips to the transition files. The first one for Richter has his source DNA from Dominic Petros, who is the mutant Avalanche. We saw a version of Avalanche in X-Men The Last Stand, and this kid has seismic abilities. The next kid's source DNA was from Christopher Bradley, aka Bolt. So this kid has the ability to manipulate electric currents. And one wonders if Logan remembers this name as his Team X colleague played by Dominic Monaghan in X-Men Origins. Laura's page, subject X2323, source DNA, James Howlett. And her age is 132 months months or 11 years, but her emotional IQ is 74 to 78 months or six and a half years, which would explain why Laura acts immature for her age. Logan finds another uncanny X-Men comic in Laura's backpack, which includes an image of Sauron, the humanoid Pteranodon villain from the Savage Land in the X-Men comics. On the other side, we see Charles, Jean Grey, Cyclops, Logan, and Colossus attending a funeral in an issue titled Death of a Mutant. So here, Logan just tries to demythologize these comics for Laura. In the real world, people die and no self-promoting asshole in a Leotard can stop. But Eden in this movie we learned is a real place, meaning some actual member of the X-Men that Logan considered to be an asshole consulted on these in-universe comic books to get the word out to young mutants everywhere to try to make it to this refuge. Now we later see a close-up of the comic creators that include a Jay Davis and a Jay Banco, but who was their asshole consultant from the X-Men? It would have to be someone who was alive at the end of Days of Future Past. Maybe Cyclops, maybe Hank McCoy? I don't know about Hank because that version of Beast does not wear a leotard. Maybe Storm or Jean or Rogue or Kitty, but I don't know if Logan would call them assholes. Maybe Bobby Drake? I'm not sure, but I think the best option would be Peter Rasputin Colossus because Peter was a known doodler and Colossus is on both of these covers. One of them tossing Wolverine in the fastball special as if it's like a clue to say, Wolverine, let me throttle you north to our sanctuary. But a crazier theory could be a version of Wade Wilson consulted on these comics. I'll save that theory for the danger room. In a bar, there's a TV ad for Canewood, which is another company that's part of the poisoned corn syrup pipeline. And the word Canewood appears on shipping containers towed by mag self-driving semis. Will Munson later explains how Canewood took over American sugar production. Shucking their cloned up super quick. It's in those drinks that everyone's having. When Logan gets back to the hotel, the Reavers are already there and boom, another psychic seizure. To show his struggle as he moves down the hallway, Hugh Jackman had two crew guys restraining him with ropes. As he passes a Reaver in the doorway, the guy's eyes slowly turn to look at him, which is just another reminder that all these people are suffocating. But Logan takes advantage of this to kill all the Reavers in the room. He stabs one guy through the head and the impact causes the door lock to swing out. Every moment of this movie is just crafted with detail. I love that. Logan needed Laura's regeneration ability too, though. Her resistance to the seizure allows her to crawl forward with the syringe and hands it off to Logan. It's clear why Charles was categorized as a WMD. He weeps as he apologizes to everyone he passes. And a little detail on the fire engines that roll up are these spinny LED displays on the front, which could just be to signal drivers in 2029, or maybe as an indicator that these engines are self-driving. Because we see lots more self-driving trucks on the highway. On the truck radio, we hear about a Westchester incident. Many are noting a similarity to the Westchester incident and took the lives of seven mutants, including several of the other. So Charles killed seven mutants at the X Mansion with one of his seizures. Logan and Caliban said that they had been living off the grid for a year, and Logan told Pierce that Charles was dead, so the public record is probably that one of those seven was Charles, and maybe they considered Logan to be another one, because Logan is living off the grid under the name James Howlett. So if not all of the seven mutants who were killed were X-Men, based on the wording of this, several would mean at least five, so there would be three other X-Men who died. So those three would include either Cyclops or Storm, Jean Grey, Rogue, Iceman, Colossus, Shadowcat, or Beast. Just again, based on who was at the X Mansion in the Days of Future Past ending, whoever else of the X Men didn't die in the seizure were probably the ones in Eden in Canada. I'm just thinking it would have been Jean Grey, because she's also a super powerful psychic Omega level mutant, maybe Storm, and then Colossus would still be alive, and that those three would be working maybe with the Canadian Alpha Flight mutant group. So, auto semis from Mag and Canewood run them off the road. These trucks slow down for no one, so when the horses get out of the trailer, they all nearly turn into meat. Charles uses his psychic powers to guide the horses back to the trailer, and 
we meet Will, Catherine, and Nate Munson. Logan introduces himself as James, his daughter Laura, and his father Chuck. With the Munson family, Logan experiences a pleasant family dinner that I don't think we've ever seen him get to have. Logan hints that Chuck used to run a school. There was a kind of special needs school. Um, he was there too. After dinner, Nate lets Laura listen to his music player, which plays Rory's Devil's Whisper, which includes the lyric, you better run, run from the devil, which we could see as a warning to all these characters that the devil is coming to this house. Logan and Will go to the neighboring Canewood property to fix the water pump, and the new owners threaten them. One, I have a lawyer now. Two. This scene functions as a contrast to the opening scene, whereas Logan then could not control his rage, and here he just takes a shotgun and snaps it in half. Logan is lit with just a single light source, the truck headlights, which accentuates the scars on his arms and shoulders. And it seems like Logan's soul is healing now. He has taken steps toward family, and responsibility is suddenly important to him, and he doesn't want to leave a bigger mess for the Munsons. But all this is just a false victory to set up the most tragic moment of the film. Back in the bedroom, Charles says that this was the most perfect night he had had in a long time, but he doesn't deserve it. I think I finally understand you. Patrick Stewart's performance is incredible. He recalls the Westchester memory like it's the first time he learned of this. But the tragedy of this clarity is that he finally found some empathy with Logan's pain, but it's not Logan he's talking to. Logan. It's Logan's adult clone, X-24, and he snicks his claws into Charles's chest. And the audience knows that this isn't Logan just by how cleanly and efficiently his claws come out this time. A Wolverine's claws are always their most distinguishing asset. Charles made this confession to someone who is not Logan. The real Logan never gets to hear Charles say this. Charles, for this moment, at least before Logan later says it wasn't me, believes his caretaker suddenly murdered him. Now you'll notice X-24 wears a dark tank top, whereas Logan wears a white one, classic black hat, white hat, western trope. X-24 kills the boy Nate and Catherine, and then attacks Will, just making this a brutal murder of an innocent Midwestern family in a farmhouse in a Marvel movie. This shot of X-24 coming down the stairs and passing Logan is perhaps the most complex VFX shot of the film, but there are actually several shots of old Logan where a digital render by Image Engine was mapped over him. In this shot, Logan's stunt double served as a stand-in for the plate and then walked down the stairs past Hugh Jackman. Image Engine then placed a 3D render of Jackman's face over the stand-in. And you know what? The blend really holds up, but it does result in X-24's expression looking robotic and unchanging. Yet that works perfectly because he's supposed to be a heartless mechanical Terminator-type assassin. Even the music evokes the synth score from the Terminator film. <laughs> So Xander Rice explains that they struggled with the X-23s, assuming that they could raise children without a conscience, but... You can't nurture rage. You simply design it from scratch. It is such an evil concept, but it might be one of the most hopeful sentiments in the film. Rice is saying that it's the nature of children to seek goodness and empathy from the world, and if you raise them right, they won't ever have to discover cruelty. Cruelty, Rice suggests, is a man-made invention. When adults lower themselves to see human life as expendable on the path to power. Logan's earlier scuffle with Carl and the Canewood boys gives them an out here as they confront and stall X-24, while Charles reminds Logan of their boat, the Sunseeker, Caliban uses this scramble to grab some of the grenades and turn the table on Pierce for trying to use light to burn and torture him. Beware the light. Will Munson saves Logan from X-24 by running him over and pumping him with shotgun blasts, but turns the gun on Logan, squeezes the trigger, but the gun is empty, and he drops dead. Because from this farmer's perspective, both of these guys are monsters. And you can think of it this way, that he's trying to give Logan the death he desperately wants, but he cannot do it. Logan buries Charles by a pond and tries to say some nice words. It's got water. It's got water. He's trying to tell Charles that even though he couldn't get them to their Sunseeker boats, he did give him a view of the water. Logan passes out and wakes up at a family health clinic, seeing blue and yellow fish dangling over his head, the X-Men colors. So after dreaming of retiring on a boat with the leader of the X-Men, Logan now finds himself drowning in a current that is flowing north towards some maybe imaginary Eden run by former X-Men. Laura had driven him here, and when she returns to the car, she removes the bag she had been sitting on as a booster seat to see for the steering wheel. Presumably, she used her foot claws to reach the pedals. In the car, Laura screams at Logan in Spanish, and lists the names of her friends, which are the other X-23 kids. Jonah. Gideon, Rebecca, Delilah, Who's that? So let's break these down. Jonah, aka Puppeteer, is the kid who can manipulate the movements of others by forcing them to mimic his own movements. And they did shoot a scene for this where he pantomimes putting a gun to his own head to get another guy to deal off himself. In the Marvel comics, there is an inhuman named Puppeteer. Gideon, aka Lizard Boy, has reptilian characteristics and might have the DNA of Viper or Anole. Rebecca is an empath. Delilah has ice breath, maybe the DNA of Bobby Drake. Richter is the leader of the group, the Avalanche clone who got his DNA from Dominic Petros that we talked about before. And 
comics, Richter was from the 80s New Mutants and X-Force comics and romantically gets involved with Shatterstar. The other kids in the group include Bobby, who's the kid with the electric bolt powers, gotten from Chris Bradley. April, Charlotte, Erica, and Jamaica have the ability to manipulate plant life. Jackson can adapt to weather or environmental conditions, and I wonder if his DNA came from Aurora Monroe. Joey is telekinetic, and so is Julie. Maybe they both got their DNA from Jean Grey. Mira can weaken and temporarily paralyze others. Maybe DNA from Rogue? Steven can detect mutant powers. Maybe DNA from Caliban. Tamara has super strength. She later lifts Logan. And Tomas has pyrokinesis, which we saw him use in the transigen facility earlier. Maybe DNA from Pyro. Logan's condition worsens, so Laura drives the rest of the way to a rocky outpost that actually matches the terrain of the canyon that led to Eden in her comic book. We see a lookout post at the top. These coordinates actually do take you to a private farm in North Dakota, by the way. Logan's mind is blown seeing this, though. The comics were real? Logan passes out, and Tamara hoists him up the cliff. His rise in frame matches the upward jerks he rose with in the opening shot of the film. Every time he wants to die, he's just lifted back up to life. Logan suffers a nightmare and wakes up to Laura, like how he woke up from a nightmare to see Rogue in the first film. Laura finds his adamantium bullet. That's a long time ago, and I kept it as a reminder of what I am. What he is, a weapon made out of adamantium, something that can only destroy. Logan wakes up to find the X-23 kids trimmed his beard to give him a classic Wolverine mutton chop look. Though he doesn't want it, they are turning him back into the hero from their X-Men comics. Later, Logan tells Laura, Your friends, they seem nice. Kind of reminds me of... Uh... Yeah, he said to you that these kids could be the next generation of X-Men. They do share literal DNA with them. Richter radios north across the border, and we hear a female voice respond. Satellites are blind, then. Your asylum approved. So whose voice is this? Could be Storm, or Jean Grey, or Rogue, or Kitty Pride, or maybe versions of Jubilee or Mirage who were in the school in X2 in The Last Stand. Could be someone like Emma Frost. I detected a bit of an accent, so I think it's Aurora Monroe, Storm, because she also said satellites are blind during those times, which makes me think she's more attuned to atmospheric conditions and weather patterns. Now, one would think the Reavers wouldn't care about crossing a remote border to chase these kids for a mile or two, but it suggests that these border lines are patrolled by, like, Canadian drones, the Canadian government, and maybe Transigen would be risking a serious international treaty between the United States and Canada over, like, runaway mutants. I assume it's a delicate political treaty because otherwise any of those X-Men or Alpha Flight members in Eden would totally swoop in to help the kids before they got to the border. Seeing that Rice and Pierce's forces have tracked the kids with drones, Logan chases north after them. He injects himself with all of the healing serum, knowing that he is going to die. These kids try to fend off the Reavers. We see Delilah freezing a guy's arm off. Jamaica stabs them with twigs and uses them to rip one apart. But Daddy shows them all how it's done. In a long tracking shot, Logan sprints, filling his body with bullet holes. It ends with a leap pinning a guy against a tree. You can actually see footage of Hugh Jackman in the audio dubbing booth running in place to make these grunts so that he sounds out of breath. <laughs> Like the limo that he wanted to protect before, now his limo is Laura. He uses his body as a bullet shield, and then she uses his back as a ramp to leap and kill a reaver. Xander Rice shows up confirming their conspiracy to kill off mutants via the food supply. But Logan just shoots Rice through the neck before he can finish his stereotypical villain speech, because Logan's conflict is not with Rice, it's with his own legacy, and the script expedites the final conflict. Which is interesting because presumably by the end of this film, that whole tainted food supply is still in place in America. That is not the battle this movie's fighting. It's just a personal battle for Logan. Logan and X-24 used pieces of the armored truck to fight. You can see that X-24 was given more of a golden eye color, perhaps to make him look more animalistic compared to Logan. Kind of like how Sabretooth had like kitty cat eyes. The telekinetic Joey grabs Pierce and throws him down. Jamaica and the other nature girls wrap him up with grass while Delilah freeze breaths him. And then Bobby gives him these little zaps to help Logan. Richter levels the earth to flip this armored truck on X-24. Remember this flip truck. X-24 stabs Logan and drags him over to the tree and impales him on a branch. Now, how does dead wood stab through an adamantium ribcage? Well, Logan's body is deteriorating fast, and that branch looks like it missed the ribs. Laura uses the adamantium bullet to kill X-24, but Logan begins to die. Don't be what they made you. This is what it feels like and he slips away. One little detail that Hugh Jackman conveys so well, and it always gets me when I read the script, is this stage direction after Laura calls him daddy on page 124. Logan looks at her, then stiffens, takes a short breath, and in his eyes, there's a flicker of wonder. A flicker of wonder is just a sensation that I don't imagine Hugh Jackman ever got the chance to emote as Wolverine in the past nine X-Men films, because, you know, he's the older than dirt forever soldier who's just seen it all. But he hasn't seen this. It's not just relief that greets him in death. It's the wonder of a child discovering something new. So they bury Logan by a pond. So Laura is remembering how important it was for Logan to bury Charles by water. Laura eulogizes Logan with the final words of 1954's Shane. There's no living with the killing. 
right or wrong, it's a brat. But this is kind of a reversal of Shane. It's not the old man who walks out of frame leaving the kid behind, it's the kid leaving the old man behind, who in this moment of death rediscover childlike wonder. Laura is now the one with the old man's burden, the Wolverine brand that sticks. While cynics may call it derivative to end a 2017 movie by just quoting another movie, Laura is a kid with limited vocabulary and she sees her world through metatextual simulacra that take the form of films and comic books. And for her, her salvation came in reading a comic book and believing it. So why shouldn't there be an equally revelatory truth in an old Western film that meant so much to grandpa? During the scene, you'll notice that Bobby is holding a Wolverine action figure. It's clear that they wanted this moment to be our goodbye for the Wolverine character. Laura rotates the cross on Logan's grave to make it an X, to mark Logan as one of the X-Men, the hero from her comic books. What I find interesting about this is this is not something Logan would have wanted, but funerals are not for the dead, they are for the living, to look back at her fallen loved ones and remember them in a way that helps us move forward. I believe Logan sticking the landing so hard is why it was difficult for audiences after this to embrace the movie Dark Phoenix in 2019, even though it was the earlier era cast. Aside from future Deadpool movies, in retrospect, this is where the Fox era X-Men franchise should have ended. This movie was so good. And it makes Wolverine's return in Deadpool and Wolverine such an interesting creative gamble. So let's close out with what might be the most important Danger Room segment we've done yet. Feel free to stop watching now if you don't want any spoilers or theories or discussion for Deadpool 3. Okay, so when Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman announced a third Deadpool film back in September 2022, they promised not to touch Wolverine's death in this movie. How is Wolverine alive yeah. after Logan? Logan. Uh, takes place in 2029, mm -hmm. totally separate thing. Mm -hmm. Logan died in Logan, not touching that. What actually happens in our film is... And then they proceeded to improvise bits under Wham's Wake Me Up. We did a video breaking down what they actually said via lip reading, but Reynolds specifically said not touching that. And take a look at this armored truck that had been flipped over by Richter onto X-24. This same armored truck in the same forest location shows up in the Deadpool and Wolverine trailer. Deadpool may not literally touch Logan's grave site, nor may he resurrect Logan or alter this timeline to erase the events of the Logan film, but he will be visiting this location. We also have seen rumors that Daphne Keene will return as X-23 Laura, and I'm wondering if she could be keeping watch over Logan's grave, and then just tear apart Deadpool. Now, Deadpool has already parodied Logan's death in Deadpool 2. Does he consider this gravesite creatively sacred? I don't know, but I could imagine a gag where Deadpool considers this grave to be such holy ground that no jokes or meddling can happen here, and he's just going to take out his rage on the TVA Minutemen for desecrating his site while he inadvertently desecrates it further. Whatever Deadpool does here in Deadpool and Wolverine, it doesn't change how great of a film Logan is, and I expect Deadpool 3 to actually reinforce the Logan film as the Marvel Platinum standard. Lastly, that theory I mentioned. Could the in-universe X-Men comics in this Logan film have been written in consultation with Wade Wilson? Deadpool is a character that Logan would call an asshole, and even Hugh Jackman used that word in a social media post. Unlike the other X-Men, Deadpool does wear a comic-accurate spandex suit, but most importantly, the fact that these comics look like real-world Bronze Age Uncanny X-Men comics is just an insane coincidence, and arguably a paradoxical glitch in the reality of this film that could really only be explained with a meta character like Deadpool, who breaks the fourth wall and is a aware that they are all characters from comics and comic book cinema. Remember, in 2009's X-Men Origins, the plan for that version of Weapon 11 was to be really an origin story for Wade Wilson, not his final form, and that there was going to be a sequel that would have put him in his comic accurate costume. And that is why that X-Men Origins movie ends with his mouse getting torn open and him shushing us. That version of Deadpool could be the asshole who goes on to wear spandex and annoyingly survive this mutant chemical genocide, and then use comics to help the other X-Men guide mutant kids throughout the country to a safe haven of Ryan Reynolds' homeland of Canada. This theory kind of deserves to be its own video. Let me know down below how you rank Logan among all Marvel movies. Do you think it's better than Endgame? I do. Please support new rock stars with one of our Xavier Academy shirts or maybe our Deadpool Wolverine Base Off shirt. That's available at nerdriot.shop. Subscribe to all three channels of the New Rockstars Network. I'm Eric Voss. Thanks for watching. Bye.